We have been looking at various implementation aspects of quantum computing. We had looked at NMR to start with in detail. Next we will started looking at the optical approaches. So, in the first part of the optical approaches approach, uh, after we finish the basics of the tools that are used in optical approaches, we looked at the case where we were looking at linear approaches to uh, quantum computing using optics. Now, in this particular week, we will be looking at the other kinds of optical approaches which are in vogue and uh, in order to do that, let us start by looking at uh, some of the interesting problems that have been looked at in this area. So, this week which is our week 7, the first lecture would focus on optical approaches other than the linear approaches to quantum information and quantum computing. So, Q I Q C is often a common nomenclature which is used. So, the full form is quantum information and quantum computing. See the optical approaches to quantum computing we have been discussing in which where we have stated that photons often are essentially ideal for making qubits because they can be transmitted most easily that is what uh, was talked about when we were looking at teleportation for instance. So, in particular the fact that the photons do not interact with one another under normal circumstances also has a very important consequence which means that a superposition state of say a photon spin could be immune to decoherence by stray electromagnetic fields. This addresses one of the very important aspects of uh, quantum processing that we have been facing which is that we have to worry far less about error correction than a computer based on matter qubits. Matter qubits are like qubits where we had taken states of the matter and the spins and other kinds of properties and there because of strong interactions we have to worry a lot about the error corrections and decoherences and other kinds of things. However, this advantage which we have with photons that is in non interaction character also creates a problem. The photons lack of mutual interaction is a big problem for creating two qubit uh, logic gates two or multiple. This like their classical equivalents are nonlinear devices requiring qubit carriers to interact with one another. So, the lack of interaction is uh, creating a problem because in order to create multiple qubits to interact there has to be an interaction and this interaction process is sort of missing when we talk about photons. So, most of these interactions that we talk about uh, require nonlinear interactions that are hard to do with photons. In the last week what we did was we looked at the linear optical approaches. Uh, which has been uh, quite a bit of a success. We in particular talked about two specific cases, one based on the idea that we spent a lot of time on lasers. So, that one is on the principle of implementation of quantum search algorithm using classical Fourier optics using the concept of a laser and the other one which is also very popular uh, is the idea of using linear elements such as uh, using a 50-50 beam splitter where the photons entering from either side of the 50 percent reflecting beam splitter at the same time would uh, leave the device along the same path which is due to their bosonic nature and this sticking together constitutes a kind of interaction which is how they take advantage of this uh, interaction to enable even the linear optical approaches to work in such a way which looks uh, which can take advantage and allow us to implement nonlinear 
uh, interactions. So, these two interactions that we talked about uh, essentially used uh, the principles of the laser as well as the principle of light interaction, photon interaction being bosonic of nature. Um, in particular, one point also to remember is that uh, when we do the final point of these uh, studies, for instance, in the laser based approach, the final readout was accomplished by uh, measuring the mode, the laser mode with a photo detector. The laser mode actually in this case, if you remember uh, from last week, uh, was the embedded uh, data that we had for doing the processing. And so, the readout process uh, which was accomplished by measuring with the photo detector destructively determined whether one or more photons were present in a mode and some based on those studies we eventually led to the concept implementation of quantum search. There have been several other ways to get around the lack of interaction in photons. For example, use matter as intermediary between two sets of photons. Uh, this is another approach uh, which were popular since the 1990s. However, this has had its difficulties in terms of uh, scaling up. Um, these Linear approaches also suffer from the scaling up issues because um, as we discussed in last week, they scale in the linear way in terms of the resources and therefore, uh, it becomes very bulky and large in these linear approaches also. Similarly, in terms of uh, intermediary of using matter between two sets of photons and things like that also have certain difficulties associated with it. So, today we will look at uh, some other uh, approaches of optical quantum computing and maybe some sort of intermediary or some sort of other interactions of uh, photons with uh, matter which might be of use to advancing the quantum computing aspects. So, before getting there, let me actually point out a few uh, interesting aspects that we have dealt with over the last few weeks in terms of implementation. And we have sort of realized that uh, because of the way of the complexity of the problem in essence exists, there are uh, different levels of how we can um, take the advantage of the quantum part of the um, problem in this case. And there in some sense you can essentially uh, discuss it in terms of three levels of computational ability from weakest to strongest. The first one which is all optical can be done which is a essentially a classical option. It is a bit based computing in and this is essentially relying on digital concepts that we use today. Uh, the optical analog of this uses uh, uh, bits in terms of uh, sending and uh, discussing or transmitting data in terms of information. And so, all information that is encoded in fiber optic transmission for example, are still utilized, but uh, this is ultimately classical where everything is based on the bits highs and lows that we use today in terms of digital machines. We are highly familiar with this. In fact, the computer that I am currently using also uses the same concept. So, uh, and the information transfer process is done by fiber optics where it is all um, based on the principle that we are doing classically. Now, the second level of discussion that we have done while doing this uh, uh, optical approaches to quantum computing has often utilized um, wave light wave computing in some sense. So, it uh, you utilizes mostly superposition principles of a classical wave and uh, it can be uh, sort of like an analog to some level. And so, it uses its wave nature, but it not it does not really explore the entanglement part of quantum uh, systems, which is critical in terms of giving its uh, maximal uh, advantage. So, this is somewhere in the middle where a lot of success has been shown and uh, many people and uh, many of the efforts currently are quite happy with this kind of uh, in between approach. The difficulty in this uh, particular approach as of now lies in the process or lies in the resource. The scaling of the resources here can be very uh, large in order to solve big problems. So, although this is advantages then the uh, 
present classical computing and the resources required here are less than that required for uh, classical computation, but it still might not be as good as what we are looking for when we are talking about complete quantum computing, where uh, the entanglement of the quantum states are also used in addition to their wave nature. And so, there we can definitely get the exponential benefit of quantum computing for certain problems obviously. So, with this let us now see what are the other uh, aspects which have been looked at. Uh, in terms of computations based on quantum interference, uh, there has been one more effort uh, which I did not discuss last week, um, which is based on quantum information processing again once again without entanglement and uh, this was um, presented in the year 2000 where the information storage and retrieval was done through quantum phase uh, by using a uh, atomic system. So, it is sort of matter uh, intermediate was used in this particular case where uh, interaction with light and matter uh, in which the matter intermediary was used for quantum processing. Now, uh, in this case the phase, the quantum phase of the system was utilized uh, to get to the information content. And it was shown that say for uh, n state Rydberg atom re data resistor, it was possible to uh, get in information and searching done in agreement with uh, uh, Grover's algorithm. So, in, uh, in the particular work by Buxbaum and his group, uh, they used optical uh, pulse shaping approaches which I will describe in a moment uh, to effectively store and retrieve information in cesium atom of numbers up to uh, 2 to the power n minus 1 and uh, they could do only for n equal to 8 uh, up to this number. So, the key steps in this uh, particular uh, process have been similar to what has been for almost all other implementation processes. Preparation of the reservoir states in this case uh, is the high excited state of the cesium atom it is a two photon absorption, it is not a single photon process. So, it is uh, in some sense uh, difficult to achieve. So, once it is achieved the state generated would be uh, much easier to keep it there. Then is the writing of the data register in that uh, step where the state is uh, sort of stable to some level and that is being achieved by using the shaped pulses. In some sense, this shaping of pulse we will discuss here would be the encoding of the data in the optical sense and that is being now transferred into the uh, matter system in some sense of a quantum system and then reading it out within the decoherence time. Now, the key element has been here the decoherence time of the system which sort of uh, should be able to read it and that was also achieved by using a second um, shape pulse uh, to amplify and uh, detect the electric field induced ionization. So, uh, what they were able to distinctively uh, show from the other similar approaches at that time is that a single quantum system possessing no entanglement because what happened was it was basically using one single atomic uh, state what atomic system with different states. So, what you could only do or achieve in these kinds of states as we will discuss in the next slide uh, is basically superpositions of uh, different states uh, associated with the atom and there were no um, multiple atoms together which were working uh, to create an entanglement system out here. So, that way it was something which uh, sort of was similar to the previous approaches uh, of wave approaches or optical approaches or linear approaches where it uh, was all done with superposition only and not with any entanglement. So, there has been uh, similar uh, as we discussed similar approaches earlier. So, this sort of gives you uh, familiarity this is sort of similar in terms of the earlier approaches that we discussed last week of wave uh, quantum computing or linear optical quantum computing. This is sort of similar to the earlier approaches of uh, linear optical quantum computing that we discussed last week. And uh, it also does not involve any entanglement as we discuss here. 
So, in a little bit of more detail, this is exactly what happens here. There is this uh, uh, state which is generated, which is sort of metastable because of the way the interaction is needed for the state to be generated. This is a two photon interaction to produce that state and this particular state is therefore, not directly connected to the ground state that easily. Once it is there, uh, the state has a encoding of uh, this sort where the phase of one of the states is flipped with respect to the other. So, this is a read in of the phase information which is done to make sure that these uh, states are being written properly. So, it is a Rydberg wave packet which is generated and that wave packet is then read out by another uh, shape pulse which would be able to uh, ionize the system in such a way that the preferential, preferentially the state which exists or has the encoded phase is the one which will be amplified as a result. So, this was optical pulse or terahertz half cycle pulse which was applied. So, this is the initial pulse which read in the data A say and this was the other pulse which read out the data by using the ionization of the states which had this particular marked phase and uh, prefer in preference to the rest of them. And so, generally the amplification happened and the Grover's algorithm search was being performed in this particular way. So, in this case the all optical Grover search essentially is based on similar approaches where uh, earlier Wamsley has also uh, discussed this uh, actually about the same time and later where uh, they used uh, uh, light wave modulation which is uh, similar to what we have also developed in our lab here and I will actually discuss one of the techniques associated to this uh, same idea where a very short pulse which goes through a Fourier transforming in the optical sense and once we are in the Fourier domain there is a modulator in this particular case it is an acousto optic modulator. Uh, the re name of acousto optic modulator essentially means that it is a material device which is being modulated by the use of radio frequency waves that is the acousto optic interaction and uh, it is like a little hammer working on the modulator and the hammer is being uh, modulated with the with the radio frequency waves and radio frequency as we know is uh, 10 to the power minus 6 microsecond time scale and that is electronically much easy to modulate as compared to the time scales that we are talking about in terms of femtosecond uh, time scale. So, uh, in terms of time uh, the microsecond pulses are much easier in uh, microsecond modulation is much easier to be achieved and that is why it is done in the Fourier domain where the modulator is able to respond and produce interacting features which can then be um, preferentially allowed to go through or not go through or provide a phase shift. So, both phase and amplitude modulation is possible in this Fourier domain which is then inverse Fourier domain. So, this is forward Fourier transform if you may and this is inwards Fourier transform uh, which is happening because of the lens and the uh, grating pair. Similarly, here is the grating lens pair and at the end of it the input pulse is getting modulated which can be read by using a uh, spectrometer. So, this was also used by Armsley uh, although this technique was originally uh, generated and developed by us and I will get into that in a minute. Uh, so, these kinds of uh, light wave data was also uh, used by the uh, group which we just discussed the Buxbaum group where they instead of using uh, amplitude modulation they used a phase modulation in one of the one of the forms. Now, there are other ways of also doing this um, light modulation instead of an acoustic optic modulator it could be a liquid crystal modulator. Um, LCM and in this case the phase modulation is much more easily uh, done in this particular case and uh, in the particular case of this experiment which was shown by Boxbaum, um, they use the LCM technique uh, for doing the data encoding and that is why they preferentially did this whole work by using a phase um, concept whereas in the um, in the acoustic optic modulator scheme both uh, phase and amplitude can be modulated. So, both these options have been used in different cases for 
showing uh, that it can be utilized for doing fast data search in these cases. But as I mentioned that either way how we do it whether by using the light alone or by using, so this one is only using light. So, it is using superposition as we discussed earlier, this is similar to the linear optics except that we encode the data in Fourier domain and the other case is also a approach which is uh, using the encoded data, but the encoded data is now being put onto the onto the system concerned, in this case it is an atom uh, which does the interaction and gives rise to the result. But the net result in all of these cases is the same that it is essentially taking advantage of superposition. So, this is LCM um, based uh, pulse shaping, but the advantage is they all can do pretty fast pulse shaping. There are some subtleties in regard to the uh, exact differences between LCM versus AOM. Uh, the AOM one has uh, slightly better advantages in certain aspects versus the LCM ones, um, but at the end of the day the principle is the same that you go into the Fourier domain, make the shape pulses and then you make them interact. Um, and whether you do it all optically or by using a matter intermediary, they essentially give rise to the same ideas. So, uh, so, these essentially reflect similar concepts as we have been discussing in the last week. Uh, however, it is important to realize that these connections are based on the principles that we are essentially doing mostly superposition principle work rather than uh, entanglement in most of them. So, one other area where uh, light can play an important role is also to look into the principle of decoherence because uh, most cases when these discussions have happened the coherence part of the story is a issue which often goes away and similarly when we have a laser interact in some sense uh, if we would really want to do a molecule interaction which has a better chance of doing entanglement compared to an atom because there are many parallel states and also when we have um, scalability issues molecular interactions can be better because it has richer number of states or in other words if you would like to have atoms coming together and interacting whatever way we look at it decoherence is an issue which is important because it is the case where the information can be lost because of the coherence uh, being lost in these cases. So, in these cases the decoherence control is an issue which is to be important. Um, in, in case of intermolecular cases, it is something which can be controlled by using diffusion and mobility and the time scales depend on environmental conditions. So, this is something where the decoherence can be controlled by this. So, in many cases by going into um, a controlled environment like when the system is being separated out, the molecules are separated vastly away from each other or the atoms are kept separated out from each other by a large amount, this becomes an issue which can be easily looked at. However, in uh, most cases where you would like to see the information transfer interacting heavily which is one of the reasons why uh, matter is in first place being used. Uh, is you would like to have interactions to happen. So, uh, molecular states that way are very interesting because they have this intra molecular interactions which are intrinsic to molecular states and these time scales typically vary from nanoseconds or below depending on whether they are electronic vibration or rotational states. And so, this decoherence can essentially wash away any kind of information processing that we would like to do with these kinds of systems. So, bringing in matter with light interaction often creates this essential dilemma as to how this can be finally utilized for implementation. So, decoherence control happens to be a very important problem. So, a model system in this particular case can be always looked at in particular for the molecules in a way where uh, the picture is roughly equivalently stated in quantum mechanical sense. And this is a parallel problem which has been looked at in many other uh, areas of research which basically states that um, if you have a specific excitation that is then connected to or can basically dephase away or decohere away from that particular excitation to other states which are perhaps uh, not optically connected, but still 
because of the the way the construction is this is how they go away then it can be equivalently looked at by either uh, in this particular picture where it is a normal mode picture where the state is connected to other states and so on and so forth or in an equivalent eigenstate picture where we uh, diagonalize the matrix connected to this Hamiltonian and uh, as a result we get the oscillator strength being distributed over several states and so whenever an interaction happens the energy is essentially distributed excitation is distributed to many states it is sort of like the wave packet picture. So, irrespective of how uh, the excitation occurs there are many more states than a single state which gets populated and that is the picture which we know typically know as a wave packet. So, uh, this has actually remained uh, a big problem because this, uh, this essentially has led to an area of control uh, where the control can be in terms of uh, any physical or chemical processes where which involves molecule uh, to be looked at and this has remained as an evading issue as a problem which is, a, is sort of like the holy grail of many processes that have been looked at. And one of the uh, simple pictures or the traditional pictures which has made a lot of impact in this area has been the idea of intramolecular vibrational relaxation process. So, in most of these cases if these involve vibrational states the what we are essentially looking at is uh, the states getting relaxed. Uh, the moment they are being excited and as a result it is, uh, it is not possible to localize the energy and uh, that is the randomization is an issue and this is similar of a problem which is a big issue for quantum information processing using molecules or atoms even because in case of atoms it is not exactly the same picture but once the atoms are supposed to come together to interact and generate the uh, information transfer th in the way which is missing in terms of photons not interacting the similar picture essentially works out. So, either way we look at it we have a problem which the looking at which would be giving rise to a general area of understanding for this entire problem of how the coherence or the information embedded in the system uh, can be contained to a long enough time so that it can be processed. So, that is the basic problem here and uh, we would like to pre present uh, some of the work which uh, was uh, based on some of the very uh, famous uh, initial work of uh, Felker and Zuell and many others in that region. But Zuell's work is uh, in some sense very important because he was one of the pioneers of this particular process of seeing how things happen how in real time and he had coined the term femtochemistry in terms of looking at very fast processes and how they disappear and things like that. So, he was able to also show that um, in many cases although we often always expect the energy to just go away once we excite there are cases where under the same in the same molecule under certain particular experimental conditions it is possible to see a recurrences of that um, of the state occur essentially showing as if the uh, the it is not just a one way transfer, but the connection is in both ways which uh, by the way when we look at it quantum mechanical and we set up our Hamiltonian this is what we are doing we are basically stating that these are double line arrows rather than single line and so there is always a possibility of whatever is lost out here should be coming back. But in reality often these states are uh, either so many or statistically connected to so many uh, conditions uh, that this is not possible to see these kinds of recurrences. But uh, in, in he had done some of these uh, interesting experiments where he was able to isolate the molecules to, to some level inside the conditions of gas phase um, conditions where recurrences could be seen within states. In modern day variations of these we have also seen uh, situations where um, due to a solvent um, solvent sheets and uh, solvent being around certain objects in liquids it is has been possible in liquid state studies also that uh, energy or uh, these kinds of processes can be uh, looked at as situations where recurrences or these kinds of uh, oscillating back and forth to the states concerned are occurring.
So that way speaking, this is a universally interesting problem which keeps on happening. And as I mentioned earlier, this is intramolecular vibration relaxation when you are looking exactly at vibration states. So the energy also corresponds to the vibration energy. Uh, just an interlude, typically spectroscopists or those who are associated with these often talk in terms of uh, wave numbers or electron volts because energetics, energy considerations in terms of these numbers are much better than considering something uh, as wavelength because uh, the connection to wave number is direct. So, the energy is directly proportional to the wave numbers and so and so forth. So, that is why it is a better uh, concept rather than so frequency, uh, electron volts, and uh, wave numbers are all the more popular energy units which are used for these kinds of cases. So, uh, the basic formalism I think I might have actually discussed this earlier in one of the basic classes, but uh, just in this connection, let me actually point out to you what is uh, happening here. Uh, we have an we in the simplest possible case of only just two states where the where we have one which is the ground state and another one which is just say the excited state uh, we have uh, these conditions where the applied field has some kind of a uh, frequency which is close enough to make this transition work this is omega um, so the applied electric field has a has the right kind of phase um, right kind of uh, frequency that will allow this uh, transition to occur. And when these uh, frequencies are close enough, so essentially omega um, 0 which is the energy of the which is proportional to energy of the gap is close to the applied field radiation, then this transition will happen. And that is uh, the point where this is being looked at as the resonance and all that. Um, so, the this can be looked at in terms of the field interaction and in the dipolar limit, uh, the interaction potential of these uh, two level systems can be simply written in these cases. So, I think uh, in this case uh, 1 is G and uh, 2 is E, that is how they have been labeled. And for this simple uh, two level system under applied field, the Hamiltonian is essentially uh, just the energies of the two states along with the coupling terms and in these cases the coupling terms under the dipolar limit is uh, roughly the uh, the field interacting with the dipole of the system and uh, so it is a transition dipole moment as we talk about this and that is the interaction term which makes this happen and the field can be then replaced into this and this particular uh, term um, is very important mu dot e over h cross. Um, which was what was uh, famously coined by Rabi as the Rabi frequency because that sort of kinds of took like that. And uh, this resonant gap between the two which is necessary for this uh, transition to occur is also known as the resonance frequency. So, this is the transition dipole moment of the two of this particular transition and so on and so forth. This basically looks at the integral of this connectivity between the two states. Now, this can also be true for uh, uh, if there are n sort of uh, connections because we have already talked about cases where there were two photons connecting rather than a single photon connecting. And in case uh, only the nth transition is going to happen, n photon based transition is going to happen, then the picture becomes much more simplistic because the all other processes are not going to happen. And this is typically true in experimental conditions because when you are supplying the energy, you are either supplying uh, energies which are of one of these particular kinds of uh, frequencies that we are talking about. This particular arrows represent some sort of a uh, gap uh, omega maybe. So, the uh, the gap is the omega naught let us say and uh, and uh, this, uh, this particular gap is what is being looked at and the delta is essentially looking at the gap between the exact energy provided and the little bit of a separation that might still be, right? this is sort of known as detuning. So, you are not um, exactly let us say omega naught, there is a subtle difference, but that may be good enough to do these things. And most of the time there is a 
bandwidth associated with any kind of a particular excitation. So, all these things can be taken care and these kinds of uh, interaction in the simplest possible case when uh, only say the uh, nth transition is happening in this particular case say two photon absorption is only going to happen while the single photon absorption is not going to happen. Typically, the orders of magnitude of these transitions to occur are so largely different, vastly different. So, a probability of a two photon occurring is so many orders of magnitude less than that of a single photon process happening is that once a single photon process is possible, chances are of having a two photon process extremely low and so on and so forth. So, typically what we are assuming is that we are essentially providing frequencies or energies which are relevant to only of the much smaller level so that they can only add up to produce this kind of uh, excitation to produce. And in that case, if only one of the process is happening, the problem can be simplified even in this dipolar mode to a level where this can be looked at simply in these kinds of certain logics that we have discussed. This is to encompass the fact that uh, even instead of just simply using a single photon transition, we can extend the probabilities and the possibilities to higher order processes just has been looked at by say uh, the Buxbaum group where they use multi photon processes to do their ionization and other kinds of things. And surprisingly, most of these uh, simple theoretical uh, uh, developments sort of work quite well to explain many of the experimental results. So, anyway, the, the Hamiltonian can then be transformed into whether it is in a frequency modulated frame or a phase modulated frame. Once again, some of these have been discussed earlier in some of the basic lectures, where it essentially means that we are now considering that uh, the fact that the relative motion of the system uh, based on the uh, applied frequency of the system um, are going to be put at the same level. In, in other words, it is like going to a rotated uh, frame of reference uh, given that uh, we are talking in terms of the same frame. So, um, if we are looking for instance uh, events on earth in relation to each other on the earth, then all of them are rotating at the same frequency of the earth's rotation. So, the entire uh, process of the rotation of the earth can be essentially taken away from this and everybody on that um, uh, particular rotating object can be every calculation can be done with respect to say the um, frequency of the rotation per se. So, this particular rotating frame reference can be utilized in case of um, applied field to an atomic system also where the frame of rotation is now taken as the or as the applied field. So, for instance, if the if the system seems to rotate at the applied field uh, which is omega, then uh, all it remains is the detuning from that frequency with which this uh, relative motion can be looked at and that is why it can be simplified to a situation where it it is considered to be either a phase modulated case or uh, an additional case where it is uh, being looked at in a condition where it is further uh, simplified into a uh, frequency modulated frame. So, these are all essentially uh, transformations, mathematical transformations which simplify the problem to a way so that they can be looked at easily. And uh, once these uh, frames of references are taken, these are very important when uh, people are looking at, uh, interested in looking at shape pulse interactions mostly because uh, then the modulation process defines as to whether you would like to use a frequency modulated frame of reference or a phase modulated frame of reference. Irrespective of the choice, the results would be the same. And uh, the final uh, minima or the maxima or the translation and transforms can be found and this is how the detuning. So, I have basically put it as a difference because it is irrespective of whether the, uh, the exact the uh, gap omega naught versus the applied uh, versus the resonance energy or the applied field that is been taken or how it is been looked at is irrespective the signs are not very important, but um, it is important to decide which one is being looked at when this is being developed. So, at the end of it once this is done um, in order to advan take advantage of the statistics of the problem is best to use um, 
um, the density of states or density matrices rather than use uh, Schrodinger equation, although they have essentially the same form in some sense uh, in terms of solving this uh, equation. This if we replace these as size, then it would go back to almost the Schrodinger equation that we know. And so, it is essentially solving the uh, well known Louisville equation in that sense, uh, which is a statistical version of the problem that we have looked at simply by using either one state or so. And since these are multiple states which are being looked at, so this is the right way of doing the solution. And once this is done, it is possible to modulate and model these kinds of systems. So, for instance, in this particular case, since the Hamiltonian could be uh, drawn from these experiments, where these, uh, these coupling constants and the gaps between the states could be come up from the spectroscopy done these were possible to model and that is what we had done when we looked at it and uh, we were able to look at how things change when we go from the case of being a simple uh, Gaussian pulse profile. Now, typically a Gaussian pulse profile is something which is uh, thought of coming out of a standard laser system and uh, because of the way how the system interacts and uh, how the laser is essentially being uh, set up. So, it is either a Gaussian or a hyperbolic secant, either of the two beam profiles in time which comes out from a laser. Uh, mostly uh, it is easiest to consider the Gaussian because the Fourier transform of the Gaussian is also a Gaussian. So, the spectra and the time can be correlated very easily. So, in most cases it is the profile is considered to be Gaussian when nothing else is being done to the process. And so, uh, so doing model calculations make sense when we first do it. This is basically just looking at how the system evolves in terms of, so as expected the population of the uh, um, ground state starts off um, um, at, at some point um, the, in the ground state is full and then it actually goes decays and then because of the couplings going back and forth it can actually get coupled and uh, some of the population can come back and it can decay and so on and so forth. Similarly, the inter intermediate states 2, 3 and others can get co populated depending on the coupling constant these things keep on changing. So, at any point of time if it is randomly looked at there will be populations which will be existing in many of these states and so on and so forth. So, basically there is almost uh, no control over these systems, but it is possible to have oscillations as we have been seeing in some of the experimental cases. However, if you use uh, specific uh, sh shapes of pulses, so for instance here it is a simple uh, linear frequency uh, sweep which is being provided. So, it is basically quadratic phase shift which is happening within the pulse, then it turns out that it, uh, um, it can adiabatically change the state of the system from ground to the excited irrespective of the fact that there are other states involved. And so, while the system is uh, being radiated only the two states can be coupled while the other states cannot be coupled and this is actually a very interesting condition. A principle which comes um, also is known to occur in NMR um, because in those cases this is one of the simple ways how the a spin system is being transferred from one to the other. So, generally speaking the system is taken from far off of resonance to resonance and then past resonance and um, for a simple two level system basically you take it all the way to the excited state because the character of the state changes from ground to excited as the uh, system undergoes this uh, goes through this resonance condition. The character of the state changes. Um, as you go through this and it is possible to do this. So, it is known as adiabatic passage although it is um, typically also known as adiabatic rapid passage because this has to be done faster than the uh, decoherence of these states involved. In NMR it is uh, actually uh, not that difficult uh, because the states that we are talking about are having a long enough lifetime and so it can be looked at easily. So, it is a simple adiabatic passage there, but in optics it is important to consider it as a rapid passage because the, the lifetime of the states involved might not be uh, long enough to go through this. So, these have been achieved uh, by initially by using simple uh, frequency sweep generated by either optical fibers or, um, or by using a grating 
and a lens, a gritting or lens or uh, prism pairs or uh, such that the frequency content within the within the pulse is being uh, continuously swept from blue to red or red to blue and these have been applied for these kinds of applications and uh, has been shown that it is possible to do this uh, in terms of making the population change from one to the other. Um, in order to make this look more generic, it is possible to um, make a taylor sinise expansion of the instantaneous phase of the field that we have been discussing about. So, the electric field in general looks like this as we discussed with the phase and the frequency of the applied field and uh, that can then be looked into the phase component part in terms of the instantaneous phase which is either going linearly or quadratically and so on and so forth. So, the frequency sweep, so this is our frequency sweep. Uh, that we are looking at, uh, which is basically the first order derivative of the phase, which gives rise to a linear chirp or a quadratic or so on and so forth. And that is the one which is responsible for the property of the system as we discuss. So, similarly, when we look at uh, instead of looking at a linear sweep, if we look at a quadratic sweep, it essentially takes the system all the way back, uh, all the way to resonance where they are uh, in 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 um, where they uh, are coupled and then they can go away completely uh, when the when they are brought back to the um, to the original condition so far from resonance to resonance and once again far from resonance but not in the opposite direction but in the same direction basically make sure that the state can evolve from ground to the superposition condition back to individual cases. So, in some sense this is a situation where you can see while the field is on a complete interaction happening between the states, um, but there is uh, they go back to their original states when they are done. So, in some sense the matter laser matter interactions in these cases are showing specific interactions which can be utilized in the sense that we are talking about. And similarly, the cubic chirp can also be something where it can interact and then it can go to the opposite sense to some level. Uh, but generally on during the period of the pulse, the interaction is such that they are uh, the two states at least the, uh, two particular states can be kept coupled strongly with each other. Uh, with equal uh, contribution from both of them, while the rest of the states are not involved. So, the bright state and the ground, st ground state, the bright state in the sense that which is optically coupled um, are the ones which get isolated from the rest of the system. So, in some sense while the field is on, we are, we are able to isolate the optically coupled state away from the rest of the states which lead to decoherence. So, in some sense we are basically saying that there is no possibility of decoherence under these conditions for any of the chirps that we are looking at. So, in general this was one of the things that uh, we were able to point out with this uh, work that uh, given the previous um, level of discussions and uh, work done in these kinds of systems, it is possible to sort of say that it is there is there exists a region over which it will be possible even for a uh, simple shape pulse like a, a linear sweep, there exists a region over which the two states can uh, undergo a complete coupling between each other in such a way, so that it is completely decoupled from the rest of the uh, rest of the states which create decoherence for them. Now, uh, so that is at resonance. Now, the problem is uh, generating these other very complicated shape pulses uh, which can give rise to uh, much more interesting conditions like adiabatic half passage or others is very difficult. And uh, we also know that creating smooth variations in uh, these kinds of frequency sweeps which are higher order conditions to produce uh, these uh, uh, pulses which will have frequency go to resonance and then back to uh, back away from to the original condition is very difficult. Whereas, the linear sweep uh, cases have been experimentally determined and shown. Uh, so, even under those conditions under certain sweep rates, it is possible to show these kind of results which were very 
exciting to be showing at that point of time. Uh, it could also be used in terms of multiple pulses if they are brought together close enough and that was another case where we were able to see if we could use two pulses which are linearly uh, swept say and brought together in such a way so that they also produce uh, uh, cases where there is no excitation possible. So, basically this is self induced transparency basically saying that we can take cycle the population in such a way so that there is no population net available at resonance. <coughs> So, it is similar to the similar uh, earlier conditions that we have been discussing. So, the, that they produce a coherence or a 50 50 uh, connection at resonance time at the point where they are perfectly overlapped and before and after there are no changes which happen. So, this is uh, one example of producing no population transfer and we can often call them as a dark pulse uh, which is the condition which has been shown here. Uh, so, these are cases where the frequency swept are kept in such a way so that they come and go almost each other um, in some sense. It is much easier to foresee when you have two pulses coming from uh, of opposite kinds coming together. Um, however, in a single pulse producing this would require a pulse shaper which is going to be quite uh, complicated, but uh, it should be possible sometime to, to find out these kinds of shaped pulses. Um, in general, the basic point of a pulse shaping system is to say that irrespective of what happens when you have a adiabatic condition satisfied where the population can be put to the excited state and nothing else happens versus the case where an oscillating condition exists when a simple Gaussian pulse is being used because the population can go back and forth between the ground and excited states. So, that is typically uh, the condition which we know which happens at resonance and uh, the other kind is to so one of them is sort of like the inversion pulse whereas the other kind is sort of like a dark pulse where there is no population transfer net happening as a result of the presence of pulse also. So, bringing them all together it was possible to sort of provide a semi classical sense of a C naught gate where uh, these kinds of pulses which were inverting versus dark. Um, which could be put together to produce a quantum mechanical ensemble that can either be in the ground zero excited state interacting with the control pulse where is the where our control pulse is the optical pulse provides robust pulse uh, chirped pulse inversion which is the condition 1 and the self induced transparency or no inversion or no light uh, population transfer which is the dark pulse which is occurred. So, this was another uh, way of looking at um, uh, the implementation of some of these uh, simple ways of having a matter interact with the applied field and have this kind of um, uh, overall interaction result in uh, quantum uh, processing that we are looking at. Uh, the advantage of this particular scheme however, is the fact that this really does not make it such where there is a uh, requirement of entanglement or superposition explicitly being asked for. So, the question of whether it is being it is being question it is questioning one of these is uh, not really clear and so this is a uh, somewhere this is a semi classical however, because it is essentially using the condition of the controls which are optical completely, but the state which is being used are of the matter. So, the matter intermediary <coughs> in some sense in these cases are all quantum like. So, that is the reason why this has become quite interesting in terms of uh, looking at it. So, there has been some very recent uh, uh, additional looks into these uh, optical approaches which have been uh, quite different from the linear approaches to start with and some of the other approaches that we have been talking about and one of the most recent work which uh, has happened in very recent times is the use of photonics or light matter interaction where uh, it has been used as a magnetic field to result in um, producing states which are controlling the spin character of the photon. So, now photons can also be treated as um, concepts where the spin is being used up 
and so the photon spin can be used as a important device and uh, so it is in when we talk about photon spin rather than the other aspects then it is more to do with uh, the other area of spintronics because spintronics is something where uh, anything to do with the characteristics of spin of a system is being looked at. Now, this spintronics approach to quantum computing is an entire uh, different uh, area of topic where we will be discussing a lot of issues associated with its implementation and uh, this particular approach is very interesting and it has come out quite recently. This is just an article which came out uh, last month and uh, it sort of couples the principle of uh, the photon spin in in terms of a concept of spintronics with optical Hall effect. So, it is a photonic spin Hall effect which provides a powerful approach of controlling and manipulating spin photons and this is kind of very interesting because once again um, in terms of other matter uh, spins there are always complications in terms of their difficulties of using, but with light and photons this will not be. So, with this I would like to conclude today's lecture and uh, let me uh, say that from the next lecture on for this week, we will be focusing on the problems which we have been always saying we will look at. So, all the earlier problems that we have given to you as assignments will be solved from the next lecture on in this week. Thank you.